morning, friends. We're reading chapter five today. Encounter with pride. Hmm. From the very beginning, the way up the mountains proved to be steeper than anything much afraid had supposed herself capable of tackling. And it was not very long before she was forced to seek the help of her companions. Each time she shrinkingly took hold of the hand of either sorrow or suffering, a pang went through her, but once their hands were grasped, she found they had amazing strength and seemed able to pull in li even lift her upwards and over places which she would have considered utterly impossible to reach. Indeed, without their aid, they would have been, they would have been impossible, even for a strong and sure-footed person. It was not very long, too, before she began to realize how much she needed their help in, an, in another way. For it was not only the steepness of the climb and her own lameness and weakness which made the journey difficult. To her surprise and distress, she found that there were enemies to meet on the way, who would certainly have succeeded in making her turn back had she been alone. To explain this, we must now go back to the Valley of Humiliation and see what, what was happening there. Great was the wrath and consternation of the whole fearing clan when it was discovered that Much Afraid had made her escape from the valley and had actually gone off to the mountains in the company of the shepherd they so much hated. So long as she had been just ugly, crippled, and miserable, little Much Afraid, her relatives had cared nothing about her. Now they had found it quite intolerable that, that, of, them, at, that of them all she alone should be signaled out in this way and be taken to live on the high places. Perhaps she would be given service in the palace of the great king himself. Who was much afraid that this should happen to her while the rest of the family, family drudged away in the valley of humiliation? It was not that they wanted to go to the mountains themselves, far be it, but it was intolerable that much afraid should do so. So it happened that instead of being a little nobody in the eyes of her relatives, much afraid had suddenly become the central figure in their interest and thought. Not only was her own immediate circle of fearing relatives concerned about the matter, but all of her more distant connections as well. Indeed, the whole population of the valley, apart from the king's own servants, were angered by her departure, and determined that by some means she must be brought back and the hated shepherd be robbed of his success in, in filching her from them. A great consultation went on between all the more influential relatives and ways and means discussed by which she could be captured most effectively and be brought back to the valley as a permanent slave. Finally, it was agreed that someone must be sent after her as quickly as possible in order to force her to return. But they could not conceal from themselves that force might prove impossible, as apparently she had put herself under the protection of the great shepherd. Some means then would have to be found to beguile her into leaving him of her own free will. How could this be accomplished? In the end, it was unanimously decided to send a distant connection of the family named Pride. The choice fell on him for several reasons. First, he was not only very strong and powerful, but also a handsome young man, and when he chose, could be extremely attractive. It was emphasized that if other means proved un unsuccessful, he was to feel no scruples against exerting all his powers of fascination in order to coax mu much afraid away from the shepherd. Besides, it was a well-known fact that the young man was by nature far too proud to admit defeat or lack of success in any undertaking, and that there would be no giving up on his part until he accomplished his purpose. As everybody knew, to confess defeat and return without much afraid would be the last thing possible to pride. So when he consented to undertake the task, it was felt that the matter was as good as settled. Much afraid and her two companions, therefore, had only been a few days upon their journey, and had made but slow, though steady, progress. When one morning, on turning a corner of the rocky pathway, Pride was seen striding towards them. She was certainly surprised and discomfited at this unexpected apparition, but not unduly alarmed. This cousin had always so disdained and ignored her, ignored her very existence, that at first it never occurred to her that he would even speak to her, but expected to see him pass by in the same haughty manner as usual. Pride himself who had been skulking and spying for several hours before he showed himself, was on his part delighted to find that though much afraid seemed to be travelling in the care of two strong companions, yet the shepherd himself apparently was not with her. He approached her, therefore, quite confidently, but with a most unusual affability of manner, and, and to much afraid's great surprise stopped when they met and greeted her. Well, cousin much afraid, here you are at last. I have had such a do to catch up with you. How do you do, cousin pride? said that poor little simpleton, much afraid, of course, ought to have known better than to greet, much less to stop and talk with one of her own relatives from the valley. 
but it is rather pleasant after being snubbed and ignored for years suddenly to be greeted as an equal. Beside this, besides this, her curiosity was awakened. Of course, had it been that awful and detestable craven, nothing would have induced her to stop and speak with him. Much afraid, said Pride seriously, actually taking her hand in a kindly and friendly manner. It so happened that it, at that place the path was not quite so steep and she had freed her hands from those of both sorrow and suffering. I have made this journey on purpose to try and help you. I do beg you to allow me to do so and to listen very attentively and seriously. My dear cousin, you must give up this extraordinary journey and come back with me to the valley. You don't realize the true position in which you have put yourself, nor the dreadful future before you. The one who has persuaded you to start this improper journey, Pride could not bring himself even to mention the shepherd by name, is well known to have seduced other helpless victims in the same way. Do you know that what will happen to you? do you know what will happen to you much afraid if you persist in going forward? All those fair promises he has made about bringing you into his kingdom and making you live happily ever afterwards will prove false. When he gets you up to the wild, desolate parts of the mountains, he will abandon you altogether, and you will be put to lasting shame. Poor much afraid tried to pull her hand away, for now she began to understand the meaning of his presence there and his bitter hatred of the shepherd. But as she struggled to free her hand, he only grasped it tighter. She had to learn that once pride is listened to, struggle, struggle as one may, it is the hardest thing in the world to throw him off. She hated the things that he said, but with her hand grasped in his, they had the power to sound horribly plausible and true. Did she not often find herself in the heart of hearts, thrusting back the same idea and possibility which pride was suggesting to her, even if the shepherd did not abandon her, and that she could not believe. Might it not be that he who did allow sorrow and suffering to be her companions would also allow her, for her soul's good, of course, to be put to shame before all her relatives and connections? Was she not almost certainly exposing herself to ridicule? Who could know what the shepherd might allow her to go through, for her ultimate good, perhaps, but quite unbearable to contemplate? It is a terrible thing to let pride take one by the hand, much afraid suddenly discovered his suggestions were so frightfully strong, and through the contact of touch he can press them home and through the contact of touch he can press them home with almost irresistible force. Come back, much afraid, he urged vehemently. Give it up before it's too late. In your heart of hearts you know that what I'm saying is true, and that you will be put to shame before everybody else. Give it up while there is still time. Is a is a merely fictitious promise of living on the high places worth the cost you are asked to pay for it. What is it that you seek there in that mythological kingdom above, entirely against her will and simply because he seemed to have, have her at his mercy, much afraid let the words be dragged out of her? I am seeking the kingdom of love, she said faintly. I thought as much, sneered pride, seeking your heart's desire, eh? And now, much afraid, have a little pride. Ask yourself honestly. Are you not so ugly and deformed that nobody even in the valley really loves you? That is the brutal truth. Then how much less will you be welcome in the kingdom of love, where they say nothing but unblemished beauty and perfection is admitted? Can you really expect to find what you are seeking? No, I tell you again that you feel this yourself and you know it. Then be honest at least and give it up. Turn back with me before it is too late. Poor, much afraid. The urge to turn back seemed almost irresistible. But at that moment, when she stood, held in the clutch of pride, feeling as though every word he spoke was the hideous truth, she had an inner vision of the sh face of the shepherd. She remembered the look with which he had promised her, I pledge myself to bring you there, that you shall not be put to shame. And it was as though she heard him again repeating softly, as though looking at some radiant vision in the distance, Behold, thou art fair, my love, thou, thou hast dove's eyes, thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Before Pride could realize what was happening, Much Afraid uttered a desperate cry for help and was calling up the mountain. Come to me, shepherd, come quickly, make no tarrying, oh my lord. There was a sound of loose rattling stones and of a prodigious leap, and the next moment the shepherd was on the path beside them, his face terrible to look at. His shepherd's staff raised high above his head. Only one blow fell, and then Pride dropped the hand that he had been grasping so tightly, and made off down the path and round the corner, slipping and stumbling on the stones as he went, and out of sight, and was out of sight in a moment. Much afraid, said the shepherd, in a tone of gentle but firm rebuke. Why did you let Pride come up to you and take your hand? 
If you had been holding the hands of your two helpers, this could never have happened. For the first time, much afraid of her own free will, held out both hands to her two strong companions, and they grasped her to her two companions, and they grasped her strongly, but never before had their hold upon her been so full of pain, so bitter with sorrow. She learnt in this way the first important lesson on her journey upward, that if one stops to parley with pride, and listens to his poisonous suggestions, and above all, if he is allowed to lay his grasp upon any part of one, sorrow becomes unspeakably more unbearable afterwards, and anguish of heart was, has bitterness added to it. Moreover, for a while she limped more painfully than ever she had since leaving the valley. Pride had trodden on her feet at the moment she called for help and left them more lame and sore than ever. Have a good day, friends.